All right, everyone. So it is now five o'clock and we are going to get started with our next elusive animals program. Um, before we get into it, though, just a reminder that all of our endow programs are meant to be family programs and rated PG. So if you have any questions or comments, please just keep them on topic and inappropriate, which I'm sure you all will do as I've had amazing audiences so far. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So my name is Scout Kirby and I am a wildlife educator and AmeriCorps with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, and I'm going to be your presenter this evening. Um, and tonight we'll be talking about our elusive animals in Nevada again, um, though this is part four of this four part series. So tonight we're gonna be focusing on our animals' physical adaptations. Um, if you haven't seen the previous videos, they will hopefully be uploaded to YouTube soon. Um, there's an intro video as well as one on our animals' activity patterns and also their social and habitat preferences. So to recap the last program we had, which focused on those activity patterns, um, the main conclusion I wanted you guys to come away with was that species activity patterns can make observing them more inconvenient for us because a lot of the times they don't line up with our own activity patterns. Um, but these adaptations are necessary for the survival of our wildlife. Um, so a lot of times animals will migrate out of the state, that way they can find areas with more favorable conditions that have more food, or more nesting sites. Other animals, they can't take the heat or the cold, so they're going to become inactive during dis different parts of the day. Um, and even some animals are just going to prefer um, certain lifestyles like being nocturnal, which most people aren't out looking for wildlife at nighttime, so it makes it a lot harder to find those guys. So I've been talking a lot about the iNaturalist webpage and how I've been using it through these programs. Um, for this program today, because I have more species information I want to get to, um, I'm just going to briefly go over what the different colors on our iNaturalist maps are going to be, um, since I'm going to be using those um, throughout the presentation. Um, so if you go onto the iNaturalist website and you click on a species and go to their species profile, you can scroll down on that page and see um, their map within Nevada and also within the United States. Um, but you can focus up on Nevada and there's going to be um, different shades um, for our counties according to different things. So green counties are those um, where whatever species you're looking at is listed and it has also been observed on iNaturalist in that county. Whereas counties that are colored in that kind of yellowish orange are going to be those where the species is listed as being there, but it hasn't been observed on iNaturalist yet. And then all the little red squares are the individual observations of that species that have been submitted to iNaturalist. All right, so today's program, we're going to be focusing on the physical traits that are going um, to make our animals more elusive. Um, but as always, we're going to be referring back to that main theme um, that I wanted to really hammer into you guys through this program. And that theme is that Nevada is a super diverse state um, both in terms of plants and animals. It's just a lot harder to observe our plants and our animals, more so our animals though. Um, and so these programs are just a way to introduce you to these species and hopefully get you excited to maybe go out and look for them. So to start us off today, um, a general kind um, of adaptations and just the way that our elusive animals are, um, they're more so gonna be stealthy and speedy. And so the way that I like to think about it um, if you're comparing to humans, would be something like a ninja. And that's because ninjas, they're going to take positions that are going to make them much smaller, just like our animals. They're going to be um, taking on different forms of camouflage so that they blend in and aren't detected. They also are going to be looking out to detect um, enemies and other people, so they have really sharp senses. And they're also going to be really, really quiet and really, really agile so that if they are detected, they can get out of there. And that's what a lot of um, our animals that are elusive, those are the type of physical adaptations they're going to have as well. And that's what makes them more elusive for us. So in terms of our animal's smaller size, it's going to be more difficult for us to find animals that are smaller, um, but it's really a beneficial adaptation to be smaller in body size, especially in Nevada, um, because those animals are gonna have reduced habitat and resource requirements, which as we said in previous programs, Nevada has um, a lot of resources and habitats that are really limited in the state and they're restricted to certain areas. 
Um, so animals that don't have to rely on that many resources are going to fare better in the state. Um, and then a lot of our smaller animals are going to make use of microclimates, um, which are just restricted areas that are going to be different in the type of climate that is within them compared to the surrounding habitat. Um, and some of them are going to create their own microclimates, others are going to rely on other animals um, in order to find them or use them. So to get into that, so on the left side right here, I have a spiny pocket mouse, which is found more so in the southern portion of Nevada, so where it's really hot and arid. Um, and so these guys are actually adapted um, to live in that habitat by not having to drink any water throughout the day. Um, so they are going to be getting all of the water they need by eating different foods like seeds. Um, and so generally animals that specialize in eating seeds are called granivores. Um, and so a lot of our smaller rodent species that live in the hot, dry deserts down south, um, there a lot of them are going to be adapted to just eating those seeds and getting all their water content from those seeds, which is really, hey, really Scout, good. it looks like we're having some technical difficulties. You are cutting out for a couple of people. Oh, okay. So just hold on for a second. Yeah, no worries. Is this happening for anyone else or is it still working fine for everyone else? Go ahead and send me your answer in the Q&A, please. Sorry, everybody, just want to make sure everybody that's in attendance is able to hear me and see what's going on. So it looks like for a handful of people, there are some technical difficulties going on. Um, but for most, it seems like everything looks fine. Um, I will go ahead and send you guys, if it's not working for you, please go ahead and send um, a request into the Q&A box and I can send you a link to our YouTube page where you can find this uh, presentation. Hopefully it should be recording just fine. Um, and watch it another time after it gets posted. Perfect. All right. Um, so I'll kind of just start over on this slide then. So. Um, Small size is going to be really beneficial for a lot of <laughs> So small size is going to be really beneficial for a lot of animals in Nevada. Um, and that's because smaller animals require less habitat and resources in order to survive. Um, and so as earlier programs, we said that um, Nevada has really restricted and limited habitats and resources. So smaller animals are definitely going to fare better, especially in the harsher um, environments that are found in Nevada. Um, and then a lot of them are going to make use of microclimates, um, which are going to be restricted areas um, within their main habitat that are going to be different um, in the climate conditions. And generally, they're going to be more favorable, and that's why um, our smaller animals are going to make use of them. Um, so on the left side, this is a spiny pocket mouse, which is found um, in our more desertous regions in Nevada. Um, and they are going to get all of their water resource requirements from the food that they eat. So they never have to go out um, and find water to, in order to drink it and then get their water requirements. All they have to do is go out and find their food, um, which is generally going to be seeds. Um, so we call them a granivore because they're eating seeds and grains. Um, and they're going to be able to extract all the water that their body needs from that food source, which is really helpful if you live in an environment where there's not a lot of water available. Um, we also have animals like this tarantula hawk, which is a parasitic wasp in Nevada. Um, and they are gonna make use of another animal um, for a microclimate. So they are actually going to seek out desert tarantulas to serve as the host for um, their egg and larva. So once the female has a fertilized egg, she's going to find a desert tarantula um, and then she's going to sting it, which is going to paralyze it, though it's going to keep it alive. Um, and she's going to deposit that egg in the spider's abdomen. Um, and then that egg will develop um, safely within that microclimate 
and it will eventually get into a larval form where it will then eat its way out of the tarantula. So not only is it a form of shelter, but it also is a food source for um, the larva as well. So really cool stuff. We also have a number of animals that are going to be using burrows as microclimates. So burrows are really important microclimates in Nevada. Um, since they're able to create um, a climate within that is, uh, has a lot more moisture and it's also going to have a lot cooler temperatures. Um, so Nevada is actually the most arid uh, state in the United States. And so these animals need to escape that um, dryness and the heat throughout the day if they're going to survive. Um, and so this snake on the left is a Smith's blackhead snake. In the middle, we have a red spotted toad. So those guys usually are going to steal burrows from other animals, so they don't usually make their own. Um, this dark kangaroo mouse on the right side will actually make its own burrow, though. It has these cute little front feet with claws to do that. Um, and it's actually going to go a step further. So during the day, if it's especially hot, um, and it feels like that dryness and that heat is getting into its microclimate burrow, it'll actually plug up the entrances um, to the different tunnels where the burrow is going. So that way, none of that hot air can get in and mess with their microclimate. Um, and then we also have animals that'll use microclimates made by things like woodpeckers. So woodpeckers are cavity nesters, meaning that they tend to drill into holes and posts and other things. Um, and they will use that as their homes. Um, once they've abandoned them, or even if they haven't abandoned them, sometimes other animals can sneak their way in and make use of that microclimate. That way they don't have to expend energy creating their own, which is really helpful. Um, so we have birds like this purple martin on the left side, as well as our state bird, the mountain bluebird on the right side. They will use woodpecker holes, um, and also our Sierra Nevada flying squirrels will as well. So getting into our camouflage. Um, so there's four different kinds of camouflage, but um, three are going to be more so used in Nevada. Um, the first being concealing coloration. So this is generally just animals that have a color scheme that blends in with their environment. So like our pygmy rabbits, they have these kind of gray, brown, cream, and even reddish colors that are going to help them blend in in their sagebrush habitats. There's also disruptive coloration, which is when animals have patterns like stripes and spots um, and different things that are going to help break up their silhouette. So um, things like peregrine falcons, for example, are going to have these different patterns. And then we also have method disguise, which is where an animal is going to try to blend in with a common object in its background. Um, so this is a western pond turtle right here. Um, and you can see them using their method disguise, especially when they're out basking on logs and rocks. Um, and that's really important camouflage for them since when they're out basking, that is when they are at some of their most vulnerable um, to predation. So they make, want to make sure they blend in um, when they're out in their environments. So in Nevada, we have animals that are going to be um, differently camouflaged according to what type of habitat they live in. And so animals that live um, in forests and especially areas with water as they tend to have more shady areas, those animals tend to be a little bit darker in coloration. So for example, we also have um, this nocturnal hoary bat. So it's gonna want to blend in at nighttime in the night sky as well. Um, but also it's gonna roost in forests during the day. Um, and as you can see, when sunlight comes down, it has this kind of um, frosty look, which is what it gets its name from, um, on its back. And that way it can kind of blend in with that sunlight as it's shining down, as well as possibly moonlight when it's out flying at nighttime. Um, and then we also have a Sierra garter snake here, um, which is more so found in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion. So where there's a lot more forests, um, as well as kind of wetter areas. And so they are more riparian species. So they're going to have this darker coloration as well as that kind of bright yellow that helps them blend in with some of the materials on the ground. Um, in our more desert regions, we're going to have animals that tend to be a little bit lighter in coloration. Um, so things like this Mojave fringe toad lizard, um, they're going to have a generally lighter color scheme to them, though they still might have some disruptive coloration like this one has on its back. Um, so if you look at the sand, there are some little dark sand granules in there. So having that kind of um, disruptive coloration with those darker and lighter spots is definitely going to help this guy blend in. 
And then we have other species like our prairie falcons, which can live up in habitats where there's going to be snow during the year. Um, so they're going to have this really white kind of um, look to them, at least on the front side. That way, when they're flying up above and coming down to catch something, um, hopefully the animal isn't able to notice them. And they also have that disruptive coloration in terms of the uh, spotting they have on their breast there. We also have a number of animals that are going to be more reddish in color, which a lot of the times people think would make them stand out more, but it is an adaptation um, for different environments. So for example, Gila monsters are going to live further south in Nevada, where there tends to be um, more red rock geology. And so they are going to blend in better in their rocky kind of red rock um, environments by having that reddish coloration on their backside. And then this is a Sierra Nevada red fox, and they are gonna live, um, according to the name, in the Sierra Nevada eco region, um, where there are going to be different pine species like Ponderosa and Jeffrey pine, and they tend to have a kind of reddish color to their bark. So um, even though it may not look like it, they still are gonna blend in really well up there. Some of our animals are also going to go through um, seasonal changes in their coloration. So. Our Sierra Nevada snowshoe hare during the summer, it needs this nice um, brown coloration to blend in with all the vegetation and the dirt that is exposed um, and the trees that are all around in the Sierra Nevada forests. Whereas in the winter, it's going to molt and get into this kind of white coloration. That way it can blend in with the snow that's going to be up there. And then some animals are going to have camouflage that varies by season, sex, and even age. So especially um, in birds and songbirds for the most part, um, they're going to look very different throughout the year um, and also depending on their sex. So this is a male vermilion flycatcher right here on the left side. Um, and he is in his, blue, his breeding plumage, meaning that he's going to be at his brightest um, right then because he's trying to attract a mate. So he's actually trying to attract attention to himself, though he would prefer it be from a female uh, flycatcher rather than a predator. But the female is going to be pretty um, dull. She has more natural coloration um, and that's going to help her blend in, especially when she is nesting and protecting um, the little baby flycatchers, which are going to look like this. So um, you can see depending um, on the age of the bird, they can also look different. So these little baby flycatchers, since they're going to be kept in these nests made of more vegetation, and they're also in these kind of darker forests that also have some lighter branches, they're going to blend in much better with this camouflage compared to, say, their dads. So one cool thing I also learned is that there are some animals that have both color and size flexibility, meaning that they can change colors and also change their sizes. Um, and this is really cool in our common chuckwallas. So based on the name, you can tell they are not a necessarily elusive species. They have over 200 observations on iNaturalist. Um, but I figured they would be a really good species to highlight for this just because they have so much variation. Um, so just as you can see in these pictures, they have a ton of different colors that they can be in even different patterns. Um, and that can be dependent on their habitat, but also um, the temperature of their environment and also their mood. So they're like little mood rings that can change colors um, according to that and other things. Um, and then they're also able to change their size. So um, they're pretty um, loose. They have a lot of loose skin and they kind of have a pot belly to them. So they're a much larger lizard compared to our other species in the state. I believe they're the second largest um, lizard in North America. Um, but they can actually make themselves bigger, which is going to make them harder to catch because they'll wedge themselves down in these little rock crevices um, and then they'll inflate their lungs and puff up their bodies so that they get really, really stuck and wedged in there. And then they also have this rough skin on their um, all over their body and then also their claws that can help to give them better grip while they're wedged in there. Um, and that's super helpful to keep away from predators, um, though there are some that have been able to outsmart them. So humans, um, Native Americans in the past actually had to create special tools in order to catch and hunt uh, chuckwallas. So they had these really cool 
um, hooks that they were able to create that could reach into the crevices and get the chakwalas out. So just to show you uh, how awesome that adaptation is, like we had to create a tool in order um, to get around it. So that's super neat. All right, so now let's talk about um, our animal senses and their detection abilities. Um, so animals are going to have really well-developed senses um, and that's so that they can keep safe from predators and also so that they can go unnoticed when they're hunting prey. Um, but it's also going to make it harder for us to find them since they will usually detect us before we detect them. They're gonna have much better um, and more developed senses than we do. So for example, we have channel catfish in Nevada, um, which are really, really cool. And um, one of the cool senses that they have is they have about 100 to 300,000 taste buds that are all over their body. Um, so they're mainly concentrated in these barbels up front, um, but they're also going to be all along the body and even on the fins. And those taste buds are basically just <laughs> tasting the water and trying to detect proteins. Um, and then they also have other adaptations. So they got those big eyes um, that are gonna hopefully help them to see underwater. If that's not enough, they have those barbels to help um, feel out into the water and touch different things, sense vibrations. And then all fish are gonna have this lateral line that goes down their body. Um, and that is going to be basically just a bundle of sensory um, organ. It's a sensory organ that has a bundle of sensory receptors. Um, and those are going to detect movement as well as vibrations and then also pre pressure gradients in the water. So they can get a ton of information um, from these different senses, even though they're not using them in the same way that we would. Um, we also have desert hairy scorpions, which are um, technically an arachnid, so they're related to spiders. Um, and they are going to also have this really cool way that they detect vibrations in their environment. So they have all these little um, tiny hairs that are on their tail as well as their pinchers. I believe they're about a millimeter in length, um, but they're really cool because they can not only detect vibrations on the ground, um, they can detect changes in air movement and they can also um, detect chemicals that are in the air as well. All right, so now I'm going to talk about our snakes, though this is specific to um, two different groups in Nevada. So our pit vipers, which are going to be our rattlesnakes, um, but also our boas. So our rubber and rosy boa are also going to have um, this adaptation, um, which is known as a pit, and this is a heat sensing organ. Um, so these animals, when they're going out and hunting, they're not only going to have a visual image that they get from their eyes of their prey, but they're also going to have that coupled with a heat signature that they're going to um, develop in this pit organ that is then going to be transferred to their brain. And there it'll couple those two images together to create something like this. So not only are they seeing just the visual outline of the animal, but they're also seeing that um, heat signature, which is going to make it a lot easier for them to detect their prey, but also then it's going to make it easier for them to detect us too. And then another sense, which is going to be found in all snakes, so even non-venomous ones like this long-nosed snake, um, they are going to be using their lower jaw as a way to process um, ground vibrations. So they are going to have all these little tactile receptors. Um, that means having to do with touch all along their bodies and even on their faces. And that way when something is approaching them and there's changes in ground vibrations, um, those vibrations are going to be sent along their lower jaw up to their quadrate bone, which is near the back part of their jaw. Um, and then that information is going to be sent or those vibrations will be sent into the middle ear and then the inner ear and then into their brain where it will be processed and then that will inform them of what's going on in their environment. We also have animals that have really good senses of smell. So things like our American badgers, um, they can actually smell 700 to 800 times better than humans, um, which is really, really cool. And a lot of the times you can tell that animals um, have a really good sense of smell just by them having a really big nose on their face. So 
Badgers for sure are going to have a really good sense of smell. Um, they actually can smell through soil. So when they're in their burrows, they can smell animals um, that are around them, even if they're underground. And they can also smell animals through snow. So um, they're able to be active year round because they can um, still hunt their prey um, when there's a layer of snow on the ground. They can smell through that. Um, an interesting thing I learned though is that so a lot of weasels um, and even American badgers are immune to rattlesnake venom and that is how um, they can prey on them. But actually um, I learned that the American badger, the very, very tip of their nose where it's the most fleshy and sensitive, if they get bit there, it's actually not immune. And so they can actually experience um, reactions from the venom if they get bit on the tip of their nose, which I thought was pretty interesting. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, an olfactory organ. So olfactory refers to smell. Um, and this is going to be called the Jacobson's organ. And it's found in a number of different animals, um, but especially it's well-developed in snakes and lizards. Um, you can also find it in amphibians and then some mammals. So in humans, we used to have um, this organ, which we still do. It just doesn't have, it doesn't serve its function anymore. So it's considered a vestigial um, organ on us. It doesn't do anything. Um, but for other animals, it does still work. And how it works is, for example, when a snake sticks out its tongue, it's going to be um, bringing in air as it takes that tongue back in. And while it does this, this odor molecules that are in the air that are mixed with um, different fluids in the mouth are going to be brought up to this Jacobson's organ which is in the nasal cavity technically, but it's just above the roof of the mouth. Um, and that's going to be connected to the brain so that they can gain information about these liquid compounds that are in the air um, through this Jacobson's organ. And a lot of the times um, they're going to be things like pheromones, um, which pheromones are going to be um, chemicals that are released by potential mates most of the time and that are um, let out to encourage reproduction, um, but they also can detect changes um, in for other animals as well. So they can also process information from other organic compounds that aren't pheromones um, that may just be chemicals that are being let off by predators or prey. And one cool thing about this Jacobson's organ is some animals are able to um, enhance how much it's able to um, take in and what information it can tell them by using what's called Fleming response. Um, and this is especially going to be prominent in a lot of our ungulates, so our hooved animals like our bighorn sheep, um, as well as our canines and our felines, so things like dogs and cats. Um, and generally, Fleming response is just going to be facial expressions that animals do um, that are going to help them to focus on those different liquid um, scents that are in the air and help enhance the function of the Jacobson's organ. Um, so what they're going to do is they're generally going to kind of lift up their head. Um, they're going to lift up their lower lip, and they'll also kind of extend their tongue a little bit. And while they're doing this, they're going to hold their breath because they don't want to take in any more air. They want to just um, circulate that bit of air they have in their mouth and that way that Jacobson's organ is able to process more information from it. And then cats especially, they'll kind of do this thing where they look like they're yawning and they'll just stick out their tongue um, a little bit and hold that kind of facial expression. And that's just them trying to get more information about their surroundings. So moving on to some silence adaptations. It's very important that our animals are quiet, not only so um, they can make sure that humans aren't bothering them, but also so that they can, um, if they're hunting, that way they can get their prey and make sure that they have a meal. Um, and also so that predators aren't gonna be able to find them. And so a lot of the times this has to do with varying communication methods. So our animals will use different um, communications like auditory, which has to do um, with speaking or making noises, visual having to do with sight, tactile having to do with touch, um, and olfactory having to do with smell. So for example, we have canyon bats like this guy on the right side, um, and they are going to be echolocating, which most people know that you can't um, usually hear bats echolocating. Um, but just to give you an idea, humans can only hear up to about 20 kilohertz in frequency, whereas canyon bats are going to echolocate at a, about 113 kilohertz. 
So we're definitely not going to be able to hear them and a lot of animals aren't going to be able to hear them, which is much better for them. Um, that way they can just go around and eat their um, bug meals and hopefully not get any predators that are drawn attention to them. We also have Columbia spotted frogs like this little guy and they are actually really cool in that they have a breeding call that they usually will do above water but it's going to be much louder um, and so sometimes they'll actually go underwater and they'll call down there that way it's more muffled um, and that way if there's any predators around in the area they're less likely to hear that and detect that and be able to then go in and eat them. So we also have white-tailed jackrabbits, which are going to rely on visual as well as tactile cues when it comes to communication. Um, so a lot of times when they feel like they're in danger, one of the things they'll do is they'll lift up their tail and kind of flash a white tail at the other jackrabbits. And that lets them know that there's something dangerous in the area and they need to be on alert. Otherwise, they are also going to do that thing that we always see in the movies where they'll thump that big back foot on the ground um, and that's going to send vibrations through the ground to the other rabbits and they will then know that there's danger in the area and that they need to go and hide or possibly just, you know, hunker down and try to stay still. So desert iguanas are really interesting animals in how they are going to communicate. Um, and so they're going to use visual as well as olfactory cues. Um, so they have these really enlarged and developed femoral pores on their thighs, which are going to secrete this stinky, kind of sticky substance that they're going to rub around on branches and rocks um, in their habitat and within their territories. Um, and so one, that stinkiness is going to be a cue to other uh, desert iguanas that smell it, that they can then recognize that individual or um, if they can't recognize the individual, the male might be able to tell it's another male and he'll have to go out and maybe defend his territory then. Um, but otherwise, in the heat of the desert, that smell actually goes away pretty quickly. Um, and so one of the ways that our iguanas are able to deal with that is that um, sticky paste that they secrete is also going to reflect UV light. Um, and the lizards can see UV light, so they can see that cue then even once the smell has worn off, um, whereas a lot of animals aren't going to be able to see UV, so they won't be able to pick up on that communication. So silence is also important when it comes to how our animals move, whether you're a predator or a prey, you wanna be as quiet as possible so that way you don't give away your position. So for example, in our owls, um, like this Northern pygmy owl, which is one of the smallest North American species, um, they're gonna fly really, really quiet, in fact, silently. And that's because they have these really cool feathers that um, are gonna have fringes along the end that are able to capture um, air and able to muffle the sound while they're flying so that when they come in and swoop down on an animal, it's actually not going to be able to hear them approaching, which means that we're not going to be able to hear them when they're out flying at night either. So um, definitely something that's going to make them more elusive. Other predators like bobcats are going to be primarily hunting on the ground. So they have really cool adaptations for their feet to make them silent when they're um, kind of stalking around. Um, so they're going to have really soft toe pads, for example, as well as these longer fur around their pads so that that can help muffle sound as they're taking steps. Um, and then they always are going to have those retractable claws that'll help them get a, bit, a better grip. So especially if they're on unstable, unstable substrate, um, those claws are going to help them to keep quiet as well. And then when it comes to prey, a lot of the times our animals best move, or at least they think their best move um, when they feel threatened is to just get completely still and freeze. Um, so for example, on the left, this is a desert night snake, and they're going to not only freeze, but they're also going to kind of coil up and get small. Um, that way they kind of also look like a rattlesnake, because if the threat keeps approaching them, they're going to actually flatten their head and they might um, move around their tail a little bit to mimic a rattlesnake further. Um, but ultimately, they want just to coil up and hide enough that whatever that threat is then loses track of them and leaves them alone. Um, but a lot of other animals, like our round-tailed ground squirrels, are just going to kind of freeze in place. Um, and a lot of times, this is when they're trying to get more information about their surroundings. So whenever you see an animal 
um, in this kind of posture where they're standing up and looking around. Um, that's more of a just kind of curious posture. They're looking around trying to see if there's anything threatening in the area. Um, so even when like our black bears do that, they're just trying to get a gauge on what's going on that's not an aggressive posture. All right, so now we're going to get into some species highlights. Um, and our first is going to be the spotted bat, which is a super cute bat um, in Nevada. And it is listed throughout the state, so in all of our counties, um, though it's only been found in these areas, at least on iNaturalist, those observations have been logged there. So kind of near uh, Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge and also kind of down here. Um, but they mainly have been found during the summer months as that's when they're going to be breeding. So that's when they, as well as other animals, are going to be most active since they're going out and feeding a lot. They're also going to be taking care of babies um, and also seeking mates before they even have the babies. So they're definitely going to be most active during these times. And then spotted bats are going to be a migrating species that um, do not necessarily stay in Nevada during the winter time and they are going to fly south. That way they can get to more favorable conditions. Um, but the habitats you can find them in, they can be found in a variety of habitats, um, including areas where there's grasslands or agricultural areas, um, as well as canyon lands. But the two things they need is water and they need rock crevices. So they're going to require um, habitats that have those rock crevices for them to roost in as well as the water because, well, they need to drink. And also they are going to be primarily eating bugs and bugs are generally going to congregate around water sources um, or at least the ones that they are eating. So they are going to require habitats with both water and that rocky habitat for their shelter. But they're really, really cute bats. They're medium sized. So they're not as small as some of our um, other bat species. And they're going to actually have the largest ears of any bat in North America. So that's really, really cool. And part of the reason why they have those really large ears is so that they can hear as much as possible when they're out echolocating. Though when they're not echolocating and they're just going back to roost, they don't necessarily need those big ears and they're probably going to get in the way. So one of the cool adaptations they have is that um, flexibility in size in that when they're not hunting, these ears will kind of deflate and wrinkle up around their heads. That way they're not as much in the way. Whereas when they are hunting, they're going to push all this blood up into their ears and get them really big and inflated. That way they can take in um, as much um, auditory information as possible while they're hunting those bugs. Um, which I looked online and found that for the most part, these guys tend to fly higher up in the air. So that can possibly be a reason why they're more elusive. Um, so make sure you're looking up and not even just like, you know, barely above the tree line, but also apparently maybe a little higher. They might be higher up up there, depending on if the bugs are there. Um, but they're able to get up to those heights because they have these really, really cool wings, um, which enable them to take part in true flight. So they are the only mammal that is capable of true flight. Things like sugar gliders and flying squirrels, um, they glide. They are not true flyers. They don't have wings, um, but our bats do. So spotted bats have really, really neat wings, as well as other bats too. Um, but they're really cool because they have this really nice wing membrane that's going to allow them to fly and help give them lift. Um, and then also they're pretty strong flyers and they have quite a bit of maneuverability um, and agility while they're flying because of the way their bones are placed um, and also their muscle positioning in their wings. So looking at this graphic compared to like a bird, um, most of their bones and muscles are going to be concentrated up near the top of the wing. Whereas you can see the fingers of the bat have kind of stretched out throughout the membrane. Um, and they also have that thumb at the top. So they have a lot more maneuverability um, compared to most birds. And so generally when you see birds flying, they're a little bit more straight um, and more smooth when they're flying. Bats are going to be kind of doing acrobatics and sharp turns um, when they're up flying in the air since they're chasing bugs. Um, so they're going to not necessarily fly the same way as birds. So sometimes you might mistake them, but you can look um, at that kind of flight pattern as a reference. All right, so how you can find spotted bats in Nevada? Well, like I said, there's two iNaturalist observations. So 
based on that information, it's going to be pretty difficult, though. Um, there is this observation up at Nash Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, which a couple weeks ago I went camping up there at the Virgin Valley Campground. And I do believe there are spotted bats up there because we heard them at nighttime. Um, so I would like to say that they are up there. If someone else wants to go camping up there and check it out and report back to us, that'd be awesome. Um, but also they're down here kind of, they're supposed to be throughout the state though. So. Um, it just means that people need to go out and find them. Um, they're going to be mostly active, though, during that breeding season. Um, so one of the cool things I found online was the last time that the Nevada Department of Wildlife was able um, to find these bats was in June of 2018. So they captured two spotted bats at uh, Locks Ranch, which is over in Railroad Valley, so right over here. Um, and they, in that area, there's habitat for them. They have those ponds as well um, as some rockier areas nearby. So they were able to catch two spotted bats, which was really, really cool. Um, and there's also two previous captures of spotted bats in the state. Um, but as far as I could find, those were the only captures that Endow ever had. So as far as I know, we've only caught four. So even researchers that are going out and trying to find these animals are having a hard time catching them because they're just so elusive. But like I said, breeding time is going to be the best time to look for them. Um, so sometimes the females are going to form these maternal colonies where they'll kind of all roost together with their babies um, since there tends to be more protection in groups than when you're on your own. Um, but generally the males are going to just kind of go off on their own and otherwise they're pretty solitary bats. So um, breeding season is definitely going to be the best time since they're more likely to be either together when they're finding mates or when they are in their maternal colonies. Um, but they're going to be most active um, generally in the hour after sunset and then the hour before, or yeah, the hour after sunset and an hour before sunrise. Um, and that's typically a crepuscular activity pattern. Um, so around twilight. And generally, that's when insects are going to be pretty active, too. So it makes sense that their activity pattern kind of follows with their prey. Um, and generally, they're going to return to the same areas um, where they have previously hunted. So if they find a good spot that has a lot of bugs, um, they're going to keep going back to that spot instead of trying to find new areas. So um, if you are able to find areas where there's verified spotted bats, like at Locks Ranch, um, it's a good idea that they might still be out there and using that um, similar area. And then one of the coolest things about spotted bats is that you can hear their echolocation. So we said earlier, most of the time you can't hear bats echolocate because they're at such high frequencies and humans can only hear up to 20 kilohertz. Um, but spotted bats generally echolocate from 9 to 12 kilohertz, so we can actually hear them. Um, so when I was at that Virgin Valley campground, this is exactly what we heard. Which it kind of sounds like bugs, but when there are quite a few of them all kind of buzzing around looking for insects, you can definitely um, hear them. So I am going to say that it is likely, hopefully, that you can find them up there. I want to go up there again just to make sure myself. All right, so the next animal we'll talk about is the calliope hummingbird. Um, I put that pronunciation there so that hopefully I don't end up mispronouncing it, um, but calliope. So they are the smallest North American breeding bird, um, and they're also the smallest long-distance migrant in the entire world. So they are a very tiny um, but very hardy bird. So they're listed throughout Nevada, and that's because um, they have both their breeding range as well as their um, migration routes that go through the state. So for the most part, in the southern portion of the state, they're going to be migrating as well as kind of up through this area, um, whereas they have more breeding habitat over near the Sierra Nevada ecoregion, and then also in the northeastern portion of the state um, near the Jarbage Mountain Range. Um, and they're only going to be found in Nevada when they're migrating and during their breeding season. Um, so generally from the spring until the end of summer, and then they're going to be migrating um, back south, which is how they get that um, name having the longest migration. I'll show you a map later where they go. Um, but in Nevada, they're going to be preferring habitats that are 
usually a little bit higher in elevation up in the mountains, and they're going to be either conifer forests or mixed forests. So mixed forests are more so going to be, they can have conifer trees, so like pines. Um, they can also have trees that are going to lose their leaves every year, so things like aspen and stuff like that. Um, but these are going to be the habitats that our birds are seeking out. And that's because they have all the things that they need for their breeding season. So they're going to have a ton of nectar sources in the form of flowers. They're going to have different materials for them to make their nest out of, as well as branches to put them on. And they're also going to have perches for the males because they are extremely territorial and they um, spend about 50% of their time out on these perches during the breeding season so they can defend their territory. Um, but as you can see, different parts of the state are more in their migration route um, when they're going up to a little bit further north to breed. But there are different areas um, throughout Nevada where they are going to be breeding. So that summer um, range, that means their breeding range. But mostly it's going to be up near the Jarbage Mountains um, and then also in the Carson Range over here. So these guys, like I said, are really, really tiny birds. Um, even the guy, the boy birds are going to be super tiny. They don't get much bigger than the females, whereas in some bird species, like in our raptors, so like eagles, the females tend to be larger than the males. But in hummingbirds, they're just both going to be really, really tiny. Um, so they weigh about the same as a ping pong ball. So they're super, super light, which is going to really be helpful um, when they're flying because they need to hold themselves up with these tiny little wings um, that flap about 50 to 200 times every single um, minute. So they can fly, they can flap them quite a bit, and they can actually get up to speeds of about 60 miles per hour. So they can do a pretty fast flight, and that's mostly due to one, that small size, but also they have really well-developed pectoral muscles, which are these chest muscles up here that are going to be connected to their wings. Um, and their pectoral muscles actually make up about 30% of their total body weight. So that just goes to show you how important those muscles are and how important flight is for these birds. So they're going to be really agile flyers as well. Um, but as you can see, just based on um, this picture, they're not much bigger than some of the flowers that they're gonna be feeding from. So they're really, really tiny animals. So that's gonna make them a lot harder to find. Um, and then also, even though the females aren't necessarily much smaller than the males, they're still going to be um, less camouflaged. So I said earlier that a lot of birds, especially songbirds, are going to be having um, a difference between the sexes in terms of how camouflaged they are. Hummingbirds are not songbirds, but they still are going to exhibit the same thing where the females are going to be much duller. And that's because she's going to be taking care of the nest while the male um, is going to be brighter because he needs to attract a female um, in order to mate. So he has to be um, super, super bright. And he's mainly going to rely on this really bright gorget, which is this set of feathers that are at their um, chin. So how you can find them? Well, one thing to look for during the breeding season is that gorget. So depending on the way um, the sunlight is shining on them, it can look much brighter or it can be a little bit more duller. Um, but the males during the breeding season will purposefully position themselves um, in order to make those gorgets reflect as much as possible in the hopes of attracting a female. Um, but like we said, they're found, they're listed throughout the state, um, though there's mostly been iNaturalist observations up here in the Northeast, as well as kind of near Carson City and Reno. And then there is at least one down in Vegas, which was likely someone caught a migrant coming through, um, since they don't really have um, their summer breeding range down there. But they're mostly going to be found during the spring and, and summertime when they're going to be breeding. Um, and like we said, in Nevada, they're looking for their flowers, their nectar source, that's the main food source. Um, also that breeding habitat where they can create those nests and also have those perches. So like I said, the males are going to spend about 50% of their time um, on these perches defending their territories. Um, and just to speak to how aggressive um, these males are, and just hummingbirds in general, they can be pretty aggressive. Um, but the males at this time when they're breeding, they'll actually fight off red-tailed hawks, which are one of the larger species of hawks in Nevada. Um, and they're definitely much bigger than these tiny little hummingbirds. So um, they're pretty feisty, um, despite being really tiny and cute. Um, but so that's one of the things you can look for is just the males out perching up on their 
um, little branches. A lot of the times they like um, apparently willow trees that have just branches hanging off um, and they'll just perch right on top there and make sure nothing is going on that they don't want going on in their territory. You can also look for them um, both when they're migrating and when they're breeding at different flowers. Um, so it is known that they do prefer red flowers um, and that is because they have actually um, developed over time an extra concentration in their cone cells, which are in your retinas. Your cones are what help you see color and your rods are what help you see in low light, so generally black and white. Um, but in their cone cells, they have this concentration that allows them to see reds, yellows, and oranges at much brighter um, variations compared to the other colors. And so over time, as this concentration um, developed, they were more attracted to those red flowers because they appear brighter to them. Um, and then also over time, flowers became brighter because they need hummingbirds in order to pollinate them. So they um, became brighter reds and oranges in order to attract those hummingbirds so that they'll come drink the nectar and then go to a new flower um, and deposit pollen from the previous flower there. That way those plants can keep reproducing, but also the hummingbird ends up fed. So it's actually a symbiotic relationship. So one thing you can look for also is um, the starburst display is what it's called. So during the breeding season, the males are going to um, push out all their gorget feathers and make this little starburst type display. Um, and that way they'll try to attract the ladies which as earlier we said, the girls are not gonna be as bright, but even on the backside, you can see they're still pretty iridescent, that green. Um, so even though they are more dull than the males, they're still, you can still see them. Um, they're still gonna be somewhat shiny. Um, they're also gonna do something that is called a shuttle display, um, which is when the males are going to go up in the air and then do these really fast 100 foot dives all the while they're going to be making these kind of zippy noises and they're also going to be um, making this buzzing noise with their tail feathers that sounds like a bumblebee um, or actually a very large bumblebee so um, if you ever hear that it might not be an insect you might have to be looking around for hummingbirds and this is what it's going to sound like <laughs> So that little zippy noise followed by um, that buzzing created by their tail feathers. So that's not their mouth, that's their tail feathers making that noise. Um, you can also look for indirect evidence in the form of their nests, though so they're really, really tiny. A lot of hummingbirds, when they lay their eggs, their eggs are only the size of jelly beans. Um, so that nest is pretty tiny and it's also really well camouflaged because they use a lot of lichens and spider webs and tree bark that are going to make a um, really blend in and also hold well to that branch. So sometimes it might be easier to find them once they've kind of been knocked off and fallen to the ground, but even then that's probably not super likely. Um, so definitely just be looking for those males um, when they're out and you can even try to attract them to your yards if you're planting flowers or if you're using hummingbird feeders, which for the most part a lot of them are going to be red um, in order to attract the hummingbirds. So make sure you're not dyeing um, any of the sugar water you're using red as that can be bad for them. That dye stays in their system um, for quite a long time. So if you're going to be feeding them, it's also cool if you would plant native uh, flowers because they're also then going to be attracting other native pollinators like our native bees and things like that. Um, but as you can see, hummingbirds are going to feed from a variety of flowers in all different colors. Um, so they are considered opportunistic feeders, meaning that they're going to eat whatever comes up to them that they can process. So they don't care if the nectar comes from red flowers, they will go to yellow flowers and blue flowers and all different kinds of flowers. All right, so the next animal we are going to talk about is Merriam's kangaroo rat, which is not related to kangaroos or rats. Its closest relative are squirrels, and it's actually the smallest kangaroo rat in the United States. So they're really, really cute little squirrel-related animals. Um, but they are listed throughout most of the state of Nevada, though most of their observations have been down here in the south. 
Um, and that's because they prefer more desert regions. They're more well adapted um, to life down there, but they can be found throughout the state too. So um, even in the Great Basin Desert, so they're a more desert dwelling animal, but we do have um, the Great Basin Desert up here. Sometimes people forget that that's a desert, but it is, and they'll live there. Um, they can be found year round, especially in the southern portion of the state. Um, that's because the temperatures are generally going to be more favorable and there's um, also going to be more resources available. Um, so they can be found throughout um, the year, though they're mostly going to be active at nighttime. Um, so they are nocturnal and they are going to be living in these kind of desert flat areas where there's not a whole lot of thick vegetation. It's kind of um, just going to have some rocks, maybe some shrubs, um, especially things like a couple sagebrush, um, even some cacti. But for the most part, um, there's not going to be a whole lot of cover in terms of vegetation, though there might be some smaller um, dead vegetation and different litter like that on the ground that can help hide them. Um, but they're really, really small, as I said. Um, and then being nocturnal is also going to make them a lot harder to find in Nevada because um, most of us are not going to be looking for wildlife out at nighttime. So these guys are going to be a little bit harder to find in that way. Um, but how they get their name is from these really cool adaptations that they have. Um, so they have these really big back feet that are going to look like a kangaroo. Um, and they can actually, they're big enough that they can produce enough power um, so that they can complete 10 foot horizontal jumps. So that is really, really useful um, in a, one, in their desert flat environment where there's going to be more room for them to complete those jumps, but also um, in order for them to escape predators, which I'll show you some video um, later on of them using that adaptation. Um, and also they're gonna have these tiny little hairs on the bottom of their feet too, um, so that if they're in more sandy environments, it, they can have more traction so that they can actually um, do those really big jumps. Um, and then they also have this really long tail that is actually over half the length of their body. Um, and that's going to provide a lot of balance and maneuverability when they're doing those really big jumps, um, as well as just when they're walking around in general. And it's also going to have some of those hairs on the back as well that can help give them more traction when they're jumping off. Um, but funnily enough, since their back feet are really well developed and a lot longer, they tend to kind of walk on um, just those two back feet rather than using all fours. So, um, they can be somewhat considered bipedal, that meaning they walk on their two legs, so like we do as humans, um, but they are capable of just walking on all fours. Though as you can see, their tiny little front hands are more underdeveloped, though they do have a decent amount of claw on them, and that's going to help them when they're making those um, microclimates, those burrows that they're going to be using, um, that especially are going to be useful throughout the day as they are more nocturnal species, so they want to avoid um, the heat stress and also the dryness during the day. Um, and they're going to create pretty complex burrows that are going to have a number of different chambers within them. Um, so they can have a chamber for nesting, they can have a chamber where they will deposit their food and cache it, so that means they're storing it. Um, they'll also have a chamber for where they can go to the bathroom that's separate from everything else. Um, but one of the reasons they have that um, food chamber in there is because they're going to be storing food throughout the year. Um, so one of their main adaptations that kangaroo rats are known for um, is that they have these fur lined cheek pouches um, that they're going to shove all these little seeds into. Um, that way they can take it back to their burrows um, and leave it there as a supply or a cache um, to come back to for later in case there's ever times where there isn't as much food available. Um, because not only in terms of their diet, getting those nutrient requirements, um, but this is also an animal like that spiny pocket mouse we talked about earlier um, that is going to be getting all of its water from its food, which is going to be those seeds. Um, but they are more opportunistic. So I just wanted to put this <laughs> picture in because I thought it was really funny. Someone submitted an iNaturalist observation um, where a Merriam's kangaroo rat got into their campground and stole someone's omelet. <laughs> so uh, also, this is a good tag. We should not be feeding animals human foods, guys. <laughs> Make sure you get your food away from the wildlife. They need to be eating these seeds 
especially these kangaroo rats, because that's the only way they can get their water throughout the day. Um, so, or throughout the night, since that's when they're going to be foraging. Um, but yeah, so they're going to be getting all of their water from these seeds. So they're super important um, diet for them. And it's really cool. They have a number of different adaptations that are going to be able to let them live um, in this really hot environment where they're only eating those seeds and not drinking water. Um, so one of the things is that they're going to try to retain more water by one, having dehydrated feces. So they're going to have really, really, really dry poop and they're not going to leave out um, as much water in that. That way they can still remain it, retain it in their bodies and it can be used elsewhere. Um, they're also going to have really concentrated urine. So their urine is about nine times as concentrated as humans. Um, which humans were going to be drinking water throughout the day. Um, and we also tend to go to the bathroom multiple times throughout the day. Whereas these guys, um, they're generally, they're going to urinate once and it's only going to be a couple drops of extremely concentrated urine. Um, and the reason they're able to do that is because they have these specialized kidneys um, that are able to concentrate their urine much more than our kidneys are able to. And that's because of their extra long loop of Henle. Um, which is just a big loop that you have um, near your kidneys that's gonna help you to process um, different liquids and things like that. But then also having that microclimate is really important for their retaining their water balance as well. Since if it's hot and dry out during the day, if they're exposed to that, it's gonna put them at greater risk. So they need to stay um, in those burrows throughout the day when it's going to be really hot so that they don't lose out on all that water that they have built up um, by eating seeds. All right, so where can you find these kangaroo rats in Nevada? So like we said, they're listed in a bunch of, the, of our counties, actually most of them, but they're mostly going to be found, at least based on iNaturalist observations, down here near Vegas, so especially out near Red Rock, which I believe there might be an ongoing study of kangaroo rats there. Um, so definitely, if you want kangaroo rats, go to Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area. Um, but they're going to be pretty solitary throughout the year, except when they're in their breeding season. So they'll be finding mates, um, as well as the females will be taking care of their babies, though they tend to do that um, inside their burrows. They have that little nesting chamber for their young, um, and they'll help raise them until they're able to be weaned, and then they'll generally um, be more independent at that point. Um, but they're also going to be pretty solitary um, otherwise. So it might be better to be looking for indirect evidence like their burrows, which they tend to create burrows that have multiple entrances. Um, and those entrances tend to be at the base of plants, though they aren't always, especially um, if they're in a more arid environment where there isn't as much vegetation. Um, but one thing that's consistent is apparently they always create burrows at an angle which I'm not sure if it was a 30 degree angle or what degree it was, but apparently that is a characteristic of kangaroo rats is they always build their burrows at a specific angle. Um, they also have those really distinct back feet, so they're gonna leave pretty distinct tracks, though there are several kangaroo rat species in Nevada, so it's gonna be hard to differentiate between them. Um, one of the things I saw is that you can go based off the number of toes they have. So some of our kangaroo rats won't have four toes, they'll have five toes. But Miriam's kangaroo rat has four on the back feet as well as their front feet, I believe. Um, and then they have those claws, so that's gonna leave a little mark, especially if they're going to be on substrates that are a little bit wetter. Whereas in sand, they won't necessarily leave those claw marks, but they will leave a tail uh, drag mark because that tail is way too long to carry up at all times, so it's going to be dragging on the ground and that'll show up in their tracks as well, which also you can always use iNaturalist to help you identify tracks too. So there have been random occurrences um, where people have found these Miriam's kangaroo rats out during the day, um, but these are really uncommon, um, especially since uh, they have actually been known to at nighttime when they are going to be most active. Um, if there's a full moon out or if there aren't a lot of clouds in the sky and it's the moon is really bright, they actually won't go out during those times because they are so afraid. They're so light averse, meaning they, they don't want to go out in the light, especially since predators are going to be able to see them more so. 
So I wouldn't rely on finding a random kangaroo rat, rat out during the day, though that would be pretty nice. So in general, you're going to have to be looking um, across when you're hiking on trails or if you're driving down the road at night. Um, it seems like that's generally when people see them the most. Um, but they're really, really fast animals. Like I said, they can do 10 foot horizontal jumps. So they're pretty agile. And just to show you what that's like, uh, one of their main predators are rattlesnakes. And so they are going to be using not only those back feet, but also that tail to keep themselves up in the air and achieve those really graceful jumps that are help that are going to help keep them safe. And then another video I have um, also shows how they can use their feet as defense. So they'll actually sometimes kick other animals um, to get away. So you can see that in this one. which as the snake flies, he's got quite a bit of power behind that kick. So that's a really good adaptation for them. That's really useful and gonna help them survive. All right, so now moving on to some amphibians, we're gonna talk about the Dixie Valley toad, um, which is a pretty small species. It's only about two inches in length. Um, and that could be part of the reason why it was not um, discovered until recently. So. Um, the first time it was described in a scientific paper was in 2017, so very, very recently. Um, before that, the last toad that had been discovered in North America was in 1968, and I believe it was the Wyoming toad. Um, so it's really cool that we were able to find a new species of toad in Nevada, um, and it's also an endemic species. It's found nowhere else in the world, so it's a really, really special little toad, and he's really cute too. So he's only going to be found in the Dixie Valley. Um, these little tiny Dixie Valley toads have a really restricted range um, over here, but they're going to be kind of northeast of Fallon and Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge, and they're only going to be found in that little Dixie Valley. Um, and since they're further up north in the state, though they're not necessarily super far north, um, it is going to get colder during the winter time, so they are going to likely go into their um, brumation state and they're not going to be active um, during the colder months. Um, so their natural habitat is actually only four square miles of wetlands that are on the very far eastern edge of the Dixie Valley uh, area. So they're right over here. They've got a really, really small and restricted natural range, which is partially also why it probably took us so long to find them. Um, and also they're going to be really well camouflaged. So they've got these really pretty kind of yellowy and like black and kind of brownish speckles that they got. Um, and they also got those really big eyes. So that tells you they have really good eyesight. Um, and they're mostly nocturnal. So animals that are out at night, of course, are gonna be harder for a lot of us to find, but even these guys still are gonna be really good have really good camouflage underwater. Um, but so, like I said, they have really big eyeballs. That should tell you they have really good eyesight, which actually in 2017, um, a university in Sweden did a study that they found um, frogs and toads have a dual rod system. So they have um, two kinds of rods rather than just one kind like we have. Um, and their extra set of rods allows them to see color at the absolute visual threshold of darkness. So in pitch blackness, they are still able to see color. And we, as far as I could find, have not been able to find that in any other groups of animals. So they might take the cake on best night vision. Um, but another thing that's gonna help protect them is are these paratoid glands. So these are glands that are kind of in the shoulder area behind their eyes. Um, and these are glands that are gonna secrete a neurotoxin called bufotoxin. Um, and that's going to make so that predators aren't gonna wanna eat them. So if you've ever um, let your dog sniff or lick a toad, which I like to do it just to see the reaction, they'll do the kind of bleh kind of thing. And it's super funny, um, but also not necessarily the nicest thing to do to your dog, um, but it's not gonna hurt them. So it's, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that's going to protect them from predators, and that could be why they were able to survive in such a tiny little restricted habitat for so long, since they have all these good adaptations to keep them hidden. Another cool thing they can do um, is frogs and toads are generally going to have really permeable skin, 
Um, and that means that it's going to be able to take in the oxygen from water. So their skin is really uh, thin on the surface and it has a lot of blood vessels near the surface as well. Um, and so that's going to be able to pull in oxygen from the water so that they can stay underwater for longer periods of time. And actually turtles can do this too. All right, so where you can find them? Um, well, like we said, they're only going to be in the Dixie Valley. Um, and they only have a four square mile uh, natural habitat there. And they're only going to be active during their breeding season, which is good for frogs and toads and other amphibians because they tend to have huge globs of egg masses that um, are going to lead to really big population booms for a short amount of time because usually a lot of the babies are going to get eaten. Um, but for a short amount of time, that population boom could be helpful in finding them. Um, but as we said, they're in this really restricted part um, on the western side of Dixie Valley. Um, and some of their habitat is likely to be protected. Um, and that's because they are considered a, an imperiled species in Nevada since they have such um, a small natural range. And we, since we just recently discovered them, we don't necessarily know um, all their habits, their habitat requirements, as well as their population size. So, um, we definitely need to figure those things out so we can make sure we're making the best conservation decisions possible for these small little toads. Um, but they're actually going to be found in the most geothermally active system. So Dixie Valley is that. And the um, reason why they are also um, imperiled is because there's been recent developments that um, people want to create a geothermal energy plant in Dixie Valley and people are afraid that um, that energy plant might drain those wetlands. Um, and so that's just another reason why they are considered such an imperiled species is that um, they're under risk from human development as well. But they are really, really tiny, like I said, and pretty well camouflaged. So that's also going to make them harder to find. And even their babies are pretty um, dark. They're going to be even smaller, so they're going to be even harder to find. Um, and then one thing that a lot of times I try to rely on with species that are harder to find um, is listening for their calls. So especially with birds, but also with amphibians, you can memorize their different calls. Unfortunately, the Dixie Valley toad is not known to have a breeding call that, um, which is most of the calls we generally hear when we're out looking in these natural areas for frogs and toads, but they do have a release call. So if something came up and picked up the toad or if it bothered the toad and made it all spooked, it's going to make this kind of call. So a little squeaky squeak noise, that's what they're going to do to try to defend themselves. Um, so I'm going to talk about three other endemic toads in Nevada before I get to my last animal. Um, and two of them, the Hot Creek Toad and Railroad Valley Toads, they were also first described in 2017 along with that Dixie Valley Toad um, because they were discovered um, during the same kind of um, research which was going on through, I believe, the University of Nevada Reno's biology department. Um, and underneath Professor Dick Tracy, he was doing decades long amphibian surveys in the Great Basin um, area in Nevada. And so they recently found these three new species. Um, so on this left side, I believe this is the Hot Creek Toad. On the right side, this is the Railroad Valley Toad. Um, as you can see, they look really similar, and especially um, to our Western Toads, which they are believed to be relatives of. Um, but they have developed for over 650,000 years independently in their own habitats. Um, so based off DNA analysis, as well as just looking at the difference in adaptations that they have, they are genetically distinct species. So we have three new species in Nevada as of 2017, which is super, super cool. Um, and that Hot Creek Toad is going to be found in a really restricted wetland. It's found in this tiny little drainage that comes out of the Hot Creek Mountain Range. So this is not um, a picture of that Hot Creek mountain range drainage, but this is um, a wetland in that general area. Um, whereas on the right side, um, our railroad valley toads are more so going to be in wetlands within the Tonopah Basin. 
Um, and this is a picture of their habitat that I got from the Nevada Natural Heritage Program. So looking at this map, which I think this is a super cool map, showing all these different toads and where they are in Nevada, um, we're going to get into a little bit with this Amargosa toad. So this one's going to be a little bit bigger than our other three new species. Um, and the Amargosa toad was discovered a couple decades ago. So we've known about it for a little bit. Um, but they're going to be about four to five inches long. Um, and they're generally going to have a year round um, activity. And that's because they live in this southern portion of the state um, where it's going to be warmer and where they're going to have more resources throughout the year. Um, so they're not necessarily going to go into brumation, at least and not in long a period as um, our other toads that are living further up north. Um, but they are going to be living in this tiny little area. They have a 10 mile stretch of wetland habitat along the Amargosa River um, in Oasis Valley. So they also have a super restricted habitat just like our Hot Creek and Railroad Valley toads. So this one right here will be Railroad Valley. Okay. And then right here, this is the Hot Creek toad. And then that Dixie Valley toad we talked about up here. So these three species have been separated from each other for about 650,000 years. So they are really, really cool and distinct species. And it's really neat, at least in my opinion, that we are still finding new species in Nevada even um, at this time. Um, but one thing they all have in common is they're all either imperiled or critically imperiled, um, which is really sad, especially since they're endemic, so they're found nowhere else in the world. Um, but the reasons for that is that they have a restricted range. Um, we don't necessarily have good counts on their population sizes, um, and they also are gonna be really dependent on those fragile and unique um, wetland ecosystems that they have um, developed in. And so once those are gone, or the resources that they rely on, then they're not going to be around either, um, and they're not found anywhere else. Um, I couldn't find any information on if the Hot Creek or Railroad Valley toads had um, breeding calls or if they had release calls, but I did find that the Amargosa toad um, apparently doesn't have a breeding call, but it does have a release call similar to the Dixie Valley toad. So when it's picked up, um, or when an animal messes with it, it's going to make this noise. Whoa. So that one's, I think it's a little bit louder than the Dixie Valley one. All right, so the last animal we're going to talk about is the American water shrew, which is so elusive it has zero iNaturalist observations in Nevada. Um, I looked up in the United States, it has 19 observations in the U.S. though, so even then it they don't have a lot. So they're really, really secretive animals. Um, based off the wildlife action plan that Nevada Department of Wildlife put out in 2012, and then it, I believe it was revised in 2013, um, they're going to be found more so in the Sierra Nevada ecoregion, where there's going to be these mountainous forested areas, um, as well as kind of up near the northeastern portion of the state, as well in those kind of mountainy, more forested areas. Um, and even though they're a really tiny animal and they're going to be living up in the mountains where it tends to be a little bit cooler um, and when it gets colder during the winters, they're still going to remain active throughout the year. So they are going to be active not only um, throughout the year though, but also throughout the day. So they are going to be active day and night um, and that's because they need to feed all the time, which I'll get into why in a little bit. But they're going to be always near habitats that have water. So just like in their name, what it suggests, um, they're really dependent on water sources. That is going to be partially how they're getting their prey is through, um, they're going to be looking for aquatic invertebrates. Um, but they also are going to prefer areas that have a lot of brush. So as you see in the background of this picture, um, a lot of vegetation on the ground, a lot of ground cover in the form of rocks as well as fallen logs. Um, and then also just having a stream or some type of permanent source of water nearby for them to hunt in. Um, and like I said, I looked up on iNaturalist just within the United States. Um, that's their natural range where they have been found. Um, I believe they also go up into Canada though. Um, they have only been found 19 times and it's mostly based on the pictures on iNaturalist from researchers. So I don't know if it was researchers that were looking for these shrews specifically or if they were looking for another animal, 
um, but it seems like they're more likely to be found when you're actually going out with the intent of finding them or something that has similar habits and lives in the same habitat. Um, but they can be active year round, like I said, and they're also gonna be active throughout the day. Um, and one of the reasons for that is they have this really nice form um, puffy fur that they have all over their body. Um, and so they're going to be using it um, not only to keep warm when they're on land, but also when they're down diving. So they'll even go in um, underwater in the middle of the winter when the water is going to be super, super cold. Um, and the reason they'll do that is they have this little um, layer of air bubbles that gets trapped in their fur. Um, and that's actually going to reduce their heat loss by about 50%. Um, so they're really well developed to um, swim around and also just be active in general when there is colder weather. So you can see um, in the winter time, sometimes they'll be out um, on top of streams that are frozen and things like that, or their different water sources. Um, they also become a more kind of grayish color in the winter. So they don't necessarily go through a really intense seasonal molt like that um, Sierra Nevada snowshoe hare that we talked about earlier, but they still are going to get a little bit lighter so they can blend in more with their lighter winter habitat. Whereas in the summer, they're going to be darker like this um, so that they can blend in. Because like we said earlier, habitats that are more forested and also have water, they tend to be shadier and they tend to be darker. So it makes sense for them to be that color during the summertime. But these animals are gonna have a really high metabolism. And so they actually have to eat about half their body weight every single day. Um, and so in order to do this, they need to be really, really agile hunters. So they will hunt on land. And when they're doing that, it's mostly they're eating things like fungi. Um, they might also be finding things like earthworms and snails. Um, but for the most part, they're much better at hunting um, underwater. And so part of the reason for that is they have these really big kind of paddle-like back feet that are gonna help propel them through the water. Um, and those are really important, especially since they have um, that air trapped in their fur, it actually makes them more buoyant. So it brings them up closer to the surface. Um, so they have these feet that have these tiny little hairs on them to give them more surface area so that they can propel themselves and keep them down for longer. Though generally their dives are only gonna last for about a minute at a time. Um, but as you can see in the water, they can eat things like crayfish and tiny little fish. Um, but generally, for the most part, they're going to be eating um, the larvae and nymphs of caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies. And so generally how they're doing that is they'll dive down to the bottom of the stream um, where there's kind of a mucky bottom. And that's where they're going to put their nose. So they have a really fleshy part at the end, which is going to be um, how they're going to be sniffing. But they also have a ton of these sensory hairs along their muzzles that are going to help them to feel around in the dirt and also detect movement in the water. That way they can better locate their prey. Because as you can see, you got hardly any eyes. <laughs> so they are not going to be relying on their eyesight when they're hunting or even just getting around. In fact, these guys, um, they'll sometimes use um, a form of echolocation to get around and help them to see, especially when they're underground in those tunnels um, that they will dig, or if it's they're out at nighttime as well, it's going to be harder for them to see. But they're not going to echolocate to find food like bats. They just use it to get around. Um, but like I said, they have these really cool um, little fringy hairs on their feet, and those are going to help them when they're diving. Um, but it's also going to help them do this really cool thing where um, researchers have actually found them. Um, they have the ability to trap air bubbles in these tiny little hairs and they can actually walk on water for a couple of feet. I wish I could find video evidence of it because I guarantee it's like one of the coolest things to see. But because shrews are so elusive, <laughs> There is not any that I could find, um, at least none that wasn't copyrighted. So unfortunately, here's just a picture to kind of show you they can, generally it's only about a couple feet. I think it's up to five feet they can run on water. But that's really a cool adaptation because if they're you know on the bank of a stream and a predator comes and approaches them, instead of having to run on land, they can just skid across the stream and get away from them. So I think that's a really neat adaptation. 
All right, so how to find these little guys? Um, they're always going to be near water, so like their name suggests, they like streams, especially um, in those kind of more slower moving um, bodies of water. They're not going to necessarily be in like really big lakes, though they will actually, I've heard, be around um, beaver ponds and things like that as well. Um, so they're going to be also in our more mountainous areas, generally in our forested regions. Um, so forested, mountainous, riparian habitat is what they like. And as we said, more so going to be in that northeastern portion of the state, as well as near the Sierra Nevadas. Um, that is where we have most of our more mountainous um, forests. So that's just where they're going to be. They're going to follow that habitat. But we said they're going to be active throughout the year. So you can see them out in the winter. Um, although I don't know if you're necessarily going to be hiking up in the mountains when it's snowy. So if you are, though, keep your eye out. Um, otherwise, during the summertime and when there's more mud in their habitats, they'll leave these tiny little tracks, um, which are pretty similar to a lot of the other little small fuzzy wuzzies, like mice and voles and other things like that. But actually, shrews are not rodents. They are in their own order with moles and hedgehogs. Um, so they are not considered rodents, though they do have a lot of features that are similar, like their tiny little feet. So they also have a really good sense of smell, like we said earlier, which is funny because they are apparently a very stinky animal. So during their mating season, they're going to um, emit this really apparently nasty odor that has been described as nauseating and similar to the smell of skunks. Um, so I haven't ever experienced it, so I can't tell you how bad it is, but based off of my readings online, it's not necessarily something you want to smell. Um, but that is a form of maybe um, indirect evidence. Hopefully you can track them down <laughs> that way by sniffing them out. Um, but otherwise, um, they can be active on land as well as in the water. So um, as you saw in those pictures before, when they're underwater, they're really agile and they're really fast swimmers, which they're also pretty quick on land. But um, generally, humans are not going to necessarily be looking in streams for small mammals. So um, if you're looking at the ground, you might be able to find them, especially since they're going to be eating things like earthworms, um, which another really cool adaptation about these animals that they have is they actually have venomous saliva. So a lot of times we don't think of mammals having venom, but they do. They have a venom in their saliva um, that is going to kind of paralyze their prey and make it easier for them um, to manage holding it and then eating it as well. And then, so as I said, there is not a whole lot of evidence of shrews online because they're just so secretive and elusive. Um, so the evidence I have here are from different species. These are not American water shrews. Um, this video is of a greater white-toothed shrew. So it's just to show you kind of how they act. Um, like I said, they're pretty agile and like fast, um, but they can be found in more urban areas. So this is somebody's backyard in their garden. Um, so as long as you have the correct kind of habitat, you can find them in urban areas as well. Um, and then this is what our pied bald shrew sounds like, which actually I don't even know um, if that shrew is in North America, but it was one of the only species I could find online that had a sound recording. So here is what a pied bald shrew sounds like. And then here's another recording too. And so a lot of times, since these animals are more solitary, um, these are not only noises that they use for communication, but they're also noises that they're going to use, like I said, to kind of echolocate and get around their surroundings when it's really dark. All right, so we have come to the end of our program and to the end of our elusive animal series. Um, so some basic conclusions I hope you all come away with. One is that um, there are many adaptations and natural and human factors that are going to contribute to the species elusiveness in Nevada. And so we looked at a number of different things like animals that are nocturnal or have activity patterns that are going to be different from humans like this Great Plains toad on the left. Um, they're going to be a lot more elusive, but it's going to be more beneficial for them because amphibians don't want to be out during the hottest portion of the day when they're going to dry out. So. Even though it's inconvenient for us, it's good for them. 
Other animals are going to have um, unknown populations in the state, so things like bobolinks, um, which are a really cool bird. And as of recently, I saw on Birding Nevada Facebook page, they were, I think there was a group of them spotted in northeastern Nevada. So um, they are spotted every once in a while, but we don't have a solid population count um, for when they are in the state. So that's going to make them more elusive. Um, other species like this southwestern speckled rattlesnake is going to be using habitats that are not going to be as accessible to humans. So these guys will sometimes hide out um, in mine shafts, which for the most part are going to be blocked off to humans for our own safety, um, mostly because they're dangerous and that you could fall or get crushed. But also there's going to be rattlesnakes in there too, so even another reason to not go messing around in mine shafts. Other animals will be solitary, like this western jumping mouse. Um, so it's much easier to find animals in groups rather than those that are on their own and hanging out um, as an individual. Um, and especially if an animal is territorial on top of being solitary, that's going to make them um, even harder to find since they're actively trying to keep other animals of the same species away from them and out of the area. Um, and then a lot of our animals are going to have all those kind of physical adaptations we talked about or a combination of them. So like these different horny toad species we have in Nevada. Um, they're different species, but they are going to be really small. They have really well camouflaged scales um, and they're going to have really similar habits. But that's just because they know that those habits and adaptations are going to make them um, as safe as possible and ensure their survival in the state. So my second conclusion I hope you come away with is that our species in Nevada can be so elusive that we are just discovering them now or haven't even discovered them yet, which is super, super cool. So as of now, we have about 2 million species on Earth that have been described um, in scientific literature. But a lot of researchers believe there's at least 10 million, if not more than that, um, that have not been discovered or at least have not been described in scientific literature. So just looking at this uh, graph of chordates, so those are animals with backbones, um, it's believed especially fish and amphibians are really underrepresented in the amount of species we found in the world, which Nevada can attest to given that we found three new toad species within the last uh, decade-ish or so. Um, and then looking at all species, invertebrates are actually the group that's expected to have the most um, unknown species. So. It's really cool to be able to go out um, in Nevada and maybe find unknown species or just contribute to um, different research about different animals by submitting those iNaturalist observations and things like that. Which gets on to my last conclusion that the best way to observe Nevada's diversity is to go out and research it, explore the state, and also be really patient. So always with elusive animals, you're gonna have to be patient. Um, but you can look into using different resources. So throughout this program, I mainly relied on the Nevada Wildlife Action Plan, as well as iNaturalist, um, just specifically in Nevada, those species, um, in order to figure out where our animals are, as well as what kind of species we have in the state. Um, you can also use other resources. So we talked about eBird last week, um, which is a program where you can set up alerts so that if there's a cool bird in your area or a rare bird in your area, um, it'll send an alert to your phone so that you know about it and it'll send you the location so you know where to go. There's also apps like um, the Merlin Bird ID app by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and they are gonna help you to identify animals, though it's just gonna be birds. So similar to iNaturalist. And they're also going to have more information on the range maps for those birds, as well as pictures of the different kind of plumages they have throughout the year, which is really helpful when you're not um, identifying birds during their breeding season. Um, and then you can also use different Facebook groups. So I mentioned um, the Birding Nevada Facebook page earlier. Um, that's a really good resource to get information on where animals are in the state, specifically birds. Um, but there's other wildlife pages on Facebook that you can join that are specific to Nevada as well. Also, if you're looking for um, different places to look for these animals, wildlifeviewingareas.com is a really good resource. Um, you can just put in your general location. It'll give you a ton of different parks and natural areas and viewing areas that are close to you where you can go to find wildlife. 
Um, and then also you can get different pamphlets and wildlife ID guides from the Nevada Wildlife Federation. Um, they have quite a few for the state that are pretty useful. Um, and then overall, we're gonna go back to our main theme and our main conclusion that Nevada has a ton of diversity, it's just harder to observe. So going back to that um, biodiversity map that I had in the first program, you can see down near the southern half of the state, there's a ton of biodiversity and even up into the northern half, especially when you compare it to the Great Plains, the Midwest and kind of upper northeastern portion of the United States. So in my opinion, especially as someone who has not lived in Nevada and has only been here for a couple years, um, I think it's a really special state that has a lot of really cool things to go out and explore. So definitely gonna plug that in addition to our future uh, programs that the Nevada Department of Wildlife is putting out. So we are gonna be putting out more webinars during the summer, including um, we're gonna have our Fish of Southern Nevada. That series is gonna keep going. Um, we earlier did some presentations that are going to be now being done again. So if you haven't watched them on YouTube, you can just um, sign up and watch The Wonderful World of Coyotes again. I believe we did, did the beaver program earlier, um, but also there's going to be new programs too. So all kinds of different cool things to learn about um, in terms of Nevada. If you do want to look at the past programs, you can go to our uh, YouTube page, which is NV Depth of Wildlife. Um, and there you can go to our playlist where they'll have the webinar playlist, which I looked earlier today and as far as I could find, um, Oxbow After Dark was the last one that was updated or uploaded to the YouTube page. So hopefully um, soon we'll have more uploaded. Um, but yeah, otherwise you can look at the new programs. And of course you can always go outside and actually look for these animals or whatever kind of things you've been learning about in these webinars, but always please embrace the outdoors and practice responsible recreation, not only for your health and safety, but also for the health and safety of our animals and our natural spaces. So hopefully this isn't too overwhelming, um, but based on iNaturalist and where those observations of all these different species I've talked about during this program were, um, I made this map that is just basically a whole bunch of parks and different areas um, where you can go and see these different animals. And so there's kind of a little key at the bottom to tell you what the different abbreviations mean. So NWR is National Wildlife Refuge. So for example, we said Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge is up here in this kind of quadrant that I created. Um, also, there's different state parks, national parks, state historic parks, wilderness areas, all kinds of different places um, that you can go to when you're looking for these animals. Um, but overall, I just want to say thank you because this was a really fun series for me to do. And I hope that you all really enjoyed it because I just had a lot of fun not only making it, but also presenting it to you all. Um, so make sure please to leave me um, any comments or reviews, um, I believe you have a survey that they're going to ask you to fill out after this webinar ends. So if you have feedback, I would really appreciate getting some just because I want to be able to do even better programs in the future. Um, also, if you have any ideas on programs you would want to see in the future, feel free to write those in there as well. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I hope everybody has a great weekend. Um, once again, go out there and responsibly recreate. And now if we have any extra questions, we have time to answer them. Thank you everyone for your very nice feedback. I really appreciate that. Oh, I could do a program on falcons. I did a, a program earlier um, in the spring about raptors in Nevada, but I would totally be down with doing a program on falcons specifically. Though that has just been brainstormed, so uh, give me a little bit of time to make that presentation and <laughs> sign it up. Butterflies, okay. Butter Hold on, I'm gonna have to write down a list. So butterflies and falcons. 
what animals would I see between the border of California and Nevada? Um, so that's going to be mainly that Sierra Nevada ecoregion. Um, so some of the animals that I talked about um, throughout this series, there's going to be um, pine martens up in that area, Sierra Nevada red fox, uh, Sierra Nevada snowshoe hares, uh, Sierra alligator lizards as well. Um, let me think, who else, who else? Um, the Mono Basin mountain beaver is going to be up in the kind of Tahoe, Sierra Nevada ecoregion area. Mm, who else was there? But honestly, like, especially for birds too, I can't necessarily tell you all of the birds up there, but um, from what I remember, Tahoe has quite an extensive bird list um, because it has such like unique habitats and it lies um, not only within the Pacific Flyway, but also, yeah, on that border of the Sierra Nevada mountain range and between California and Nevada. So honestly, you can find a ton of different animals up there. Hopefully that was a good enough answer. <laughs> Do you have any webinars on fishing? So we have, let me see here. Um, are you gonna listen to me? Okay, if you look here, we have some, um, we have a Southern Nevada fish series where they highlight different fish species and um, where you can find them in Southern Nevada. As far as I know, we do not have, um, a fish series for any of the other portion or regions in the state though. Cougars and mountain goats. Got it. Where do I look to find a pygmy rabbit? Okay, so pygmy rabbits are sagebrush obligate species, so they're only going to be found in habitats that have sagebrush and primarily within the Great Basin Desert. So mainly in the central portion of the state, but also up in the northern half as well. Um, as long as there's going to be a lot of sagebrush cover, you should be able to find pygmy rabbits, but they're going to be pretty small. Um, they're the smallest rabbit in North America, I believe. So how do they get their name? So pygmy is just a word that ref, um, refers to small size. So there's a number of animals. Um, we have the pygmy short-horned lizard, which is that uh, uh, horny toad. That's one of the horny toad species. What are some endangered animals in Nevada? Ooh, okay, so endangered animals. We have the Sierra Nevada um, bighorn sheep. So that's a subspecies of the bighorn sheep. And that subspecies is considered endangered in Nevada. Um, we also have, so there's desert tortoises, which are our state reptile. They are considered threatened. Um, let me see, other endangered animals. I don't necessarily know if it's endangered, but there's a lot of animals like the toads I talked about earlier that are have really critically imperiled or imperiled populations. So especially our endemic species like the devil's hole pupfish um, and a lot of like those smaller endemic species since they have such restricted ranges in Nevada, which also maybe that's a good idea in doing a presentation on the endangered and threatened species. So thank you for that idea as well. Grizzly bears. So um, grizzly bears actually are no longer in Nevada. They previously had their natural range in the state, but um, humans drove them out and extirpated them. So at this point, there are only black bears in Nevada, but they have color variation based on habitat. So they were named black bears because the first people that saw them, they saw them on the east coast where they tend to be black. On the western coast, we actually have more brown black bears. Um, so even if you see a bear out in Nevada that's brown, it's still going to be a black bear. We do not have grizzly bears, and neither does California anymore either. They extirpated them too, unfortunately. All right, so it looks like we have no questions anymore, but I'm going to stay on for about a minute or two longer in case anyone else has any more questions. Um, but yeah, if you're heading out, thank you for attending this program. And if you attended um, the entire series, then really thank you because you're awesome. But just anybody, um, I appreciate all your feedback and also just attendance. So thank you so much for participating, not only in mine, but also the other webinars we have or end out as well. So moose in Nevada, um, they don't, as far as I know, and as far as I believe, um, they do not have permanent uh, populations in Nevada, the moose. Um, they do sometimes come down from Idaho and visit though, 
Um, and the same, I believe, with wolves. They don't, there aren't any established packs in Nevada um, that we just sometimes get visitors from out of state. Though it is believed that in the future they might um, be able to move their range down into here. So you might be seeing them soon. What cacti do elf owls make their nests in? You know, I'm not completely sure. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I would guess maybe like something like a saguaro would be pretty big. Um, so they might not use that, but unfortunately I am not familiar with the cacti in Southern Nevada. So I can't answer that question for you. All right, so just wait around another minute. If anyone else has any lingering questions, feel free to submit them to the Q&A. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Hopefully you get to go out and see some of these animals um, or at least even just go research them more. They're really, really cool. I loved learning about them. All right, so I am going to, oh, oh, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Ah, thank you guys so much. I love your feedback. Ah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. All right, I'm gonna exit out. Thank you all for your attendance. I hope you have an amazing time. Until I do my next webinar, I will see you later.